Hey everybody, welcome to Jazz Truth. I'm George Colligan, and I'm out for a stroll today. It's the end of March here in Portland, Oregon, and uh, it's such a nice day. I just had to get out a few times, and uh, it's feeling like spring almost. It's actually kind of, it's almost hot today. Um, but uh, it seems like things are sort of opening up a little bit. You know, there's more vaccinations and um, perhaps getting closer to seeing some normalcy. So I'm <clears throat> very encouraged by that. And I'm, uh, as I say, cautiously and uncharacteristically optimistic. So let's hope for that. Um, so just some random thoughts about music and especially in terms of the collaborative part of music that we have not really been able to do as much as we would like over the past year. And perhaps we took that for granted. You know, if you had told me in 2019 that there would be a whole year where we wouldn't really be able to congregate and collaborate, I would have said you're crazy. But uh, that's what's been happening. And so we're not out of the woods yet, but I'm seeing signs that maybe we're turning a corner. I'm feeling better about things. So, um, but in terms of the collaborative nature of music and improvisation and jazz and that sort of thing, um, we, have bec we have sort of grown to appreciate much more since we haven't had it. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. And so um, I've been thinking a lot about the nature of collaboration and how we see it in jazz and improvised music and so forth. Um, one thing that I talk about a lot in my improv class and with students and stuff is this idea of self-sufficiency. And that's sort of been one way to deal with the pandemic from a musical growth standpoint is to focus on how you can deal with all those musical elements that we deal with on your own. One thing I do in my improv class, uh, even in under normal circumstances, I have people play whatever tune we're working on uh, by themselves and the minimum requirements, meeting those minimum requirements in a self-sufficient way um, are to play the melody, of course, but illustrate the time, illustrate the form, and illustrate the changes. So now when I say minimum requirements, that means that I don't expect what you play in that circumstance to be the most amazing solo that's ever occurred. I just want you to show me, do you know the changes? Do you know the melody? Can you play the form and can you, and can you keep the time and can you illustrate that through your improvisation? And so that of course eventually will lead to being able to expound upon that, uh, especially when you get with a rhythm section because then a rhythm section can kind of keep, keep all of that in check while you can do something that's a little bit more complex um, that maybe doesn't illustrate those things but is based off of that foundation so um, and you can do it on your instrument you can do it by singing whatever however you want to do it but in terms of knowing all those things sort of knowing the entirety of the material and not from a standpoint of, oh, well, I'll, I'll deal with it when I have a rhythm section. <clears throat> now, I'm a big uh, proponent of playing with backing tracks. In fact, um, I've been making a bunch of backing tracks for the, um, the Bob Mover Academy that is, I believe, opening very soon. And... Um, it's something that I'm going to keep working on. I've been playing the piano part, the bass part, and the drum part. Um, and um, that's something I really advocate 
um, especially in this time when we can't play together. And as a kid, I used to play along with the Jamie Aversaw records quite a bit uh, as a youngster in Columbia, Maryland. You know, being a Columbia being a suburb of Baltimore, you know, it wasn't like I could just call up a rhythm section or go to a jam session. Just we didn't have that. So in order for me to play along with something, I was primarily playing trumpet. Uh, I would play along with the uh, Nothing But Bird record. Um, you know, the I think there's a, there was a blues record, and these were actually records, but um, I'd play with the, the Bird record. I had a bunch of them, the Cedar Walton record, the, the Wayne Shorter one. Um, there was a Herbie one. There's, there's so many, Sonny Rollins, Miles. And there's really good rhythm sections on those records. In fact, the Cedar Walton record with all those Cedar Walton tunes, Cedar Walton is the pianist on the record. So it's like, who can we find that sounds like Cedar Walton? Well, Cedar's available. (laughs) So anyway, um, but whether whether you play with a backing track or not, you still have to be able to illustrate all those things. And let me give another example of how that can be. Um, what, what, well, let me give you this story. This is one of the places where I found it to be really, that, that message sort of hit me. Is, um, the first uh, time I played with Gary Bartz, it was at Twins Lounge in Washington, D.C. And I had listened to Gary Bartz quite a bit, been to his gigs, learned all the tunes that he played on those gigs. But Gary never called tunes. He just started playing. And either you knew the tune or you didn't. So at the end of this one gig, and he called all kinds of stuff. I mean, he started playing um, the theme from Beauty and the Beast, the movie. And luckily I'd heard it, so I kind of followed along. And I think he kind of dug that. But then he played uh, Witchcraft. You know, do, 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 do. And I, it's like I knew what it was, but I'd never played it. And the bass player didn't know it. The bass player was Steve Bernstein. And um, so Gary started playing it, and, and I looked at Steve, and he looked at me, and we just tried to figure it out. But Gary illustrated all those things I'm talking about. He illustrated the time. He illustrated the form. He illustrated the changes. He spelled it out so well that he basically taught us the song as we played and I really took that lesson from that and um, I think everybody should be able to do that and if you're not do if you're not able to do that then you need to go back and figure out how to do that so again it isn't about creating something that is incredibly monumental it's it's you know basically the nuts and bolts of of the material so, and that can be your foundation, but it can also, you know, foundation is really important in terms of development. So, um, so that's something I think that if we've been doing that over the course of the pandemic and we start to get back into situations where we can play, hopefully that has strengthened our capacity to play this music. Um, and, uh, both things inform each other i think if you can play something really well by yourself you can play it well with others and vice versa hopefully so um the second thing i want to talk about is in terms of how we think about collaboration and there's all different ways to collaborate but as i've gotten older i've sort of wanted to think about music at least, you know, jazz, improvised music um, in a way that gets more to that conversation and that collaborative feeling in the moment. Uh, You know, it's, you know, and I've definitely written some complex music over the years. I like to sort of contrast with my writing and I certainly love to write music. I think that music can be complex I think it can be it can be complex without being complicated. 
it can also be simple without being simplistic. So there's nothing wrong with being more simple or going for something that's more simple if you're trying to make that kind of a statement. I also think that if you have complex ideas, you should not be afraid to do that. But the question is, are you making something complicated and convoluted uh, more than it needs to be? Because sometimes that can take away from your communication with the audience and with the musicians. And oftentimes it doesn't necessarily get the best out of the situation and it doesn't necessarily make for better music. So as I've gotten older um, and more experienced and also played with you know, heavier cats and more mature musicians, I sort of see the difference. Um, I think that you can get a lot from a little, you know. And so when we think about some of the great jazz records, some of the best examples of collaboration, not all, but many of them. I mean, certainly I love Return to Forever, which is some complex music. And I love, you know, Weather Report and Mahavishnu and all those kinds of things, you know. But, you know, you also look at Kind of Blue. It's a blowing date. The music is simple. It's not simplistic, but it's simple. And it's direct. And it's it, there's a lot of logic to it. And it's also a, a, a subject, These you know, these types of tunes that Miles presented on those recording days were great topics of conversation. So, and it yielded great results, you know. Um, you know, uh, uh, something like uh, Speak No Evil is a, is a blowing date. And the music is, I mean, that's one of the greatest records ever. It's because the musicians felt like they could take that material and really make something out of it rather than feel as though there was this sort of predetermined agenda. At least that's what I get from the record. Obviously, I wasn't there. <laughs> but when I listen to that record, I say, okay, these are topics of conversation, all of those tunes, that they made into something in the moment using their experience and their ability to improvise and so forth. So I'm just looking for that more and more myself in terms of saying, what, what is the essence what is the, the, what's the important essence in making music and performing and those types of things? You know, again, you can have complexity, but if you have uh, something that's very complicated or that's very convoluted, just because you think you want to impress people or you're trying to prove something. Um, and, you know, it's a free country, sort of. So, you know, you, you can do whatever you want, but it's something that you may find yourself wondering about your own musical development is, is how often do you go for something because of a certain agenda? You know, I want to prove that I can do this or I want to prove that I can do that. There's nothing wrong with that, but is that really the best way to collaborate? You know? Oftentimes I use analogies, like social analogies, you know, because if jazz music is about conversation and it's about collaboration, you know, you can be, com you can have uh, uh, competitive drives, but I think that, you know, oftentimes the best music is made when there is no agenda that, that deals with people trying to outdo each other on the bandstand. It's more about people feeling at ease with their their their, their place in the music and, and just dealing with stuff in the moment and just listening and being open. So, in that sense, it's like if you're hanging out with your friends... You hang out with your friends because it feels good. You don't necessarily have to prove anything to your friends. You feel it, you feel at ease. You feel comfortable. So, 
I feel like it's best to have people feel comfortable on the stage and comfortable with the music. And there can be many different ways to approach that and to, to philosophize about that. I mean, I also think that, again, as I get older, and just in terms of how we frame um, this approach to music, like when people talk about, oh, I made a mistake, or, or it, just mistakes in general, or the, th that way of thinking, like, oh, I didn't play well because I played a wrong note, or that type of thing, you know. Social activity, I mean, I suppose some, some societies and some traditions you know, are much more strict. You know, in certain societies, there are certain customs that you just, you, oh, you would never do something like this. Like, for example, in Japan, I always had this weird habit when I went to Japan of putting my chopsticks in the bowl of rice, like put, taking them both and putting them in the bowl and having them stick out like that. And, and I had to be reminded that that was considered kind of a, a faux pas it had something to do with dishonoring the ancestors or something like that. I, I had no way of knowing that. So I, I had to sort of remind myself not to do that. Things of that nature. But generally, if you're with people that you're comfortable with, there isn't necessarily a sense of competition. And there isn't necessarily a sense of feeling like afraid that you're going to make a mistake. If, if that's the kind of social interaction you have, you should find some other friends. <laughs> so, um, in this way, I think music can be the same in that you can congregate, and we all want to congregate again, and you can collaborate, and you can be in the moment and accept what happens on the bandstand and accept what happens as a process, just like, and, and not not be so judgmental of everything that happens and I think in this way it'll make you want to play music more and it'll, want pe and it'll make people want to play with you more so um, this is the kind of stuff that I think about as we're sort of getting hopefully getting back into the kind of collaboration that we we crave um, but um I think that for some, especially people who haven't been doing any playing, or maybe who didn't, who haven't been doing any playing and didn't have a lot of experience before the pandemic, this may be that when people start getting back into this, that they're like, oh, I've been shedding, I've been shed, I'm in the shed and I got all these licks and I got all this stuff I've been working on and I'm ready to just prove myself. And there's nothing wrong with that really. But, I mean, whether the things that you've learned, whether the things you've been working on, like not getting hit by a car, um, you know, the things that you've been working on, when you get back into social music situations, is that going to be in context? Is that going to be appropriate? Is that going to work with the people that you're playing with? So... The context of the things that you play is always really key. Um, you might have the hippest lick in the world that you worked on for weeks, but if if it if it doesn't work in the context that you're playing, it can be it can have the opposite effect. It's like you might know some great jokes; they may be inappropriate for church. <laughs> They may be inappropriate for a children's birthday party. <laughs> and so I don't care how great that joke is or how great that Richard Pryor routine that you memorized. You don't pull that out, <laughs> you know, in front of your grandparents, maybe, you know, unless unless your grandparents are hip. So um, so that's the thing is it's so conversation is about context because it's about listening and reacting or listening and responding and you respond in a way that relates to the subject matter and that relates to what's being played at the time. So, anyway, 
uh, I hope that this was uh, informative and instructive and uh, maybe makes you think about things musically. Just some random musings that, and these things often come up in my lessons and my teaching and stuff. And so I thought it'd be nice to put in the blog. I may expand upon those things at a later point. Um, but thanks for checking out Jazz Truth. And uh, hopefully the weather is as nice where you are as it is here in Portland. We'll see you next time.